Hi, it's James Fitzgerald here today. We're going to talk about uh, putting some weight on your back squat or what we call uh, a double leg scenario. So bending the hips and the knees. Uh, I guess we should qualify uh, what we're talking about when we discuss uh, squatting in general. Um, we're going to make the assumption uh, that you're maintaining position to get in something that looks like that. Okay, just to call it to be in a squat position. We'll assume that that means you are maintaining that form when you do it. Uh, it looks something like that. That's not how I see every individual, but it gives you a concept. You're starting from standing. You get to below parallel and you stand back up. So in context for adding 25 pounds to that, um, I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about where people are and where their starting point is um, in terms of the expectations for a simple number like 25 pounds. Uh, depending upon where you are, um, it'd be fairly simple for some and it might be quite difficult for others. So let's talk about the limitations uh, based upon where that is, um, people's, I guess you can call it learning curve. So uh, there's going to come a period of time where people are not going to make improvements. It's going to come a period of time based upon their starting point. And if this is time and this is their potential for improvement, let's say with the double leg activity or with the back squat, that uh, individuals here are going to make faster rates of adaptation. Um, there's a massive percentage improvement that can be seen in a lifetime for people in weight training uh, doing back squatting. Um, if you speak to anyone that's been in the iron game for a really long period of time, there's actually a point where you're not going to continue to improve that. Now, you don't hear a lot of people discussing that because they're not, most people are not trying to sell that program um, at 70 years of age when they've been weightlifting for 50 years and their back squat is down 100 pounds than what it was 20 years prior. Um, so that's not a program you're going to go out and sell because people innately want to get better and have uh, improvements. But they may have refined their movement or they may be able to sustain a different sub-maximal work that period of time. The thing to recognize is that everyone starts in different areas, so the rate of adaptation is the most important thing for you to know in terms of improving that characteristic of one single repetition of starting with a weight on your shoulders, uh, bending the knees and the hips at the same time, going below parallel and standing back up. Okay. So when people start here with a low training age, the rate of, rate of adaptation is going to be very fast. Uh, for people who get to here, which is what I call the uh, the money program design, so not going to do an economics, but uh, it's a really great program design where people can make some improvements when they're past the honeymoon phase and the rate of adaptation is slower. And then individuals who are here um, who get to higher training age levels, uh, the ability for them to, in their absolute scores, put on 25 pounds is all time dependent. Um, but the speed of someone putting on 25 pounds in a squat scenario for here would be um, quite easy. Uh, based upon them starting at zero and to go up in 25 pounds is fairly simple. So I like to put it into three different areas to look at the limitations that are involved and then you can build on the limitations um, in relation to making improvements in 25 pounds without saying you know six weeks or eight weeks or whatever the time may be. Just knowing though people were going to improve in different rates is really key. So one of the main limitations for people in this level is actually motor control and let's call it synchronization of movement. So when people start doing an exercise and they have a contraction and the things that are at play, which is the reason why it's so important for these people to do repetitions, is that you're creating synchronization of motor units, you're making the tendons and the muscles, the metabolic system, every cell, your brain, proprioceptors around the joints, all seven to ten of them, um, they're going to be acting upon one another based upon speed and different kinds of loads. Um, but mainly you need repetitions like learning a foreign language or you know, learning how to violin, play violin, um, a complex uh, musical instrument. So the number one limiter for people making improvements at this level who are starting out with a low training age is motor control. So if you wanted to actually put on 25 pounds for their back squat, besides it not being that hard, the main thing you need to be focused on is movement and motor control. And so if you get repetitions in sequence um, and you make those patterns really good, let's say um, knees over a certain toe on both sides, um, you have great depth, you're maintaining good uh, control of the spine and spine position. Um, you have great breathing technique. Uh, you have good position where your hands are in relation to the bar. Um, you have a good uh, angle of torso in relation to your shins. You know, all those things. You repeat that over and over and over and over and change loads and progressively increase loads relative to the amount of time and repetitions you're doing, you're going to get stronger. So to add 25 pounds for those folks, uh, the only real case in where you're not going to see that 
uh, would be if people maybe cannot get into the position that I had mentioned in terms of what qualifies as being the squat. Um, people may have uh, detriments in motor control that could be in a disease state or a former injury may lack in motor control. Um, so they may have some energy that's being cut off from the brain, brain stem, spinal cord into the muscles that could create a lack of motor control. Um, so that may be the only case. Otherwise, if you're not, I really question your program and contact someone at OPEX to certainly help you if you're in this area and you're not, you're not gaining um, you know, strength like that in your squat or your double leg activity. Uh, generally for these folks here, it's uh, generally uh, tension and it's in most cases mechanical uh, or muscle fatigue that's the limiter that's involved for most people. So when you get, get past a certain training age and you develop this muscle endurance, the next you know, limitation in terms for you improving your, um, your strength is actually a mechanical thing. So it's not a connection or a motor control thing anymore, it's actually a mechanical fatigue. Um, and mechanical fatigue can be fixed by variation simply in terms of intensity and accumulation. So instead of basically just going after the holy grail of that really max attempt now, you're starting to get into an area where you have to create variations between contractions. That can get quite complex in the topic and the research on it is quite, lots of depth and a lot of breadth to it, but I'll just uh, put it into principle terms that great variation in muscle tension at this point in time is going to create possible gains in your 25 pounds on your double leg or squat activity. To give you an example, someone who's you know three months into training, to put 20 pounds, 25 pounds on their back squat could be a two month period, could be a three month period. Okay, for someone who's in this training age, let's say it's beyond three years of training age, up to eight years of training age. Let's say it's two to eight years, somewhere within that range where they're past that honeymoon period where they're getting PRs every couple of months. It will probably take them two years to gain 25 pounds on that uh, back squat or double leg. If they're only focusing on back squat itself, it is quite possible they could get 25 pounds in less amount of time, six to nine months. If you're looking for balanced fitness, you add other characteristics that you're looking to improve on that. Let's say someone hikes on Sunday, does MMA on Monday, uh, runs 5K on Tuesday, does some weight training on Wednesday, he get my drift, you know, uh, cycling class from their home over the computer on Thursday. Um, and then they do another resistance training on Friday, you can see that the rate of adaptation for that person is going to be a little longer based upon them and their training age here. Okay? So if you know that tension and mechanical fatigue is one of the main limitations for people in that training age, then to put 25 pounds on, I would suggest you going through phases of volume work within the exercise and then intensity within the exercise. And to make it real simple, this can be planned out and make it half and half relative to your training plan. And if that still doesn't make sense, um, do, a, do sets of uh, squatting uh, that could last 20 to 30 plus seconds of work, you know, for a couple of weeks. And do your average work on squatting in total, total time under tension or amount of force that you're trying to develop in a short period of time for a couple of weeks at like zero to nine seconds, okay? So you see the variation in time. That can get fairly deep, deep too, but, you know, change that up. Within those two changes, you can also change up speed, uh, the resistance, the kind of resistance, the, the, the kind of exercise, where the bar sits, um, and a bunch of different ideas as well. But just think of intensification and accumulation and mix those back and forth and you can make some improvements there. Uh, for people to make improvements here, the main limitation is the central nervous system. So it's a neural issue. So people have great motor control built and they have some variations in tension across the board built on this period of time. Most cases for people up at this point in time to do a lot of muscle endurance activity or a 50% accumulation and intensification will crush those individuals because their ability to go deep into the nervous system and fire up all those motor units per you know, for the ability that's required to improve the back squat um, would put them in a world of hurt if they were to go from, you know, 40 seconds of time under tension for a specific back squat interval, you know, most times. So for people up here, in order to make that uh, change, that advantage, there's a lot of things, um, you know, and there's, there's books written on it, you know, because it's really key as a major movement on itself uh, for so many different sports, for so many different fields of endeavors of creating force development, improving you know, back and ass strength, improving motor control of, uh, of the lower body, 
um, creating a big neuroendocrine response. There's so many important things to the back squat that the main uh, fatiguing point up here is generally how the brain works with that amount of work that you're doing under the, that load. So it kind of makes sense that if your training age is really high, um, every time you're going to put those specific loads your body has created adaptations to, you can see the intensity in relation to how far you can go into your CNS is quite high. So the main limiter for people creating, let's say in a perfect world, 25 pounds of an increase in the back squat, which by the way can take you know, a year, two years, three years for individuals. And again, the same thing applies, more characteristics involved in the training program, a less improvement on the 25 pounds. If someone's you know, you know, gaining 25 pounds every three months on a training program with 10 plus years of training age in the iron game, they're either very specific, very specific to the actual goal where all they're doing outside of back squatting is sleeping and eating and nothing else, or they're juicing. Um, and so if they are making those improvements based upon n numerous physi physiological adaptations, uh, there's gotta be something weird going on if they're making those, those speed of adaptations and at that rate. So if you know that the main limitation is neural fatigue for people trying to improve it at that point uh, in time, then the best thing these people can do is basically focus more on phases of intensity and a ton of sub-maximal efforts that perfectly apply relative to the essence of the person. Okay, so to make that sound, uh, to put it into percentages, make it sound really easy, the amount of times these people are going to go really deep into the mountain is very few over that period of training age period. Um, and for those who are doing this and doing maximal efforts with a large amount of training age, I would say that they're actually in this, we call it a being level, where the training age is not really at its maximal potential or its height or they have something under the hood that allows them to recover very quickly between every workout, or they're really not doing maxes every time they do it. Because when your training age is really high, a lot of submaximal effort, working on refining of the movement, as well as different patterns of force development, and maybe even picking on specific supplementary activities, is going to actually help here. So for people here, you know, Finally figuring out in terms of uh, breath and position, position of ribs and pelvis, you know, working a little bit more supplementary on the hamstrings, they could work on their ass and more single leg activities. They could be spending, and they usually are spending a whole lot more time away from that maximal area of let's say 10 to 20% in the training year when it's truly intensified training, okay? So if you add up all the work they do in that double, um, double leg knee flexion, hip flexion activity, um, generally a lot of it is not super intense. So rest and recovery and proper implementation of training is the number one thing that's going to get people to improve in this area uh, to put 25 pounds on their back squat. So the things that I think about for you and what can help you in terms of measuring that um, if you think of it as a, as a rule that applies I'll do a review on that. You got to know where your starting point is. So for individuals that want to figure out um, if they're going to actually improve 25 pounds on their back squat, uh, first you got to measure it. So, and you want to create control conditions so that you add those things up over time to ensure that from one spot to the next there is a control to see that what you saw in the truth of the number here is somewhat similar to the testing environment over here, somewhat similar to the next, next testing environment. So for you, if you're a coach or an athlete, uh, you want to lay that out to make sure that you're holding truth to that. Okay. And as you've heard me mention before, sometimes the truth hurts, but at least it makes you pull up your pants to ensure that you're actually moving towards that training program. So first things first, you got to test. Um, and then you should test frequently if you're here, uh, a little less frequently here. So let's just say every three weeks here, and maybe every eight weeks here, and maybe every three months here. Okay, just as an idea in terms of that. When you get on this side, maybe we'll save that for another time, but the actual testing of it gets less and less um, based upon your absolute score going down in relation to your overall strength development. But we're talking about putting 25 pounds on, so it actually makes no sense on this side of the equation to do that. Okay, and this is not biological age over here, okay? This is tr based upon iron and the training experience for your max physical potential. So, number one, uh, realize where you sit. Uh, number two, you got to test it. Uh, number three, lay out that timeline as one would be the best testing environments. So and number four, uh, create control over that testing environment. Um, so some things that uh, come up in terms of the question for people looking at that. So 
let's say for example we see a uh, variation between front squat and back squat. So we look at that number not necessarily as a rule of thumb but a guideline in terms of when those percentages should lie. So let's just say that someone's front squat is uh, a little too close to their back squat. We see some characteristics within the, within the back squat and what creates fatigue for them. Um, we want to fix that. Okay. So we work on the back squat basically so we can bring that number up because we know that the back squat being that uh, minana we call it of one of those big neural endocrine exercises improvements in that is not just a re reflection of an improvement in the back squat an improvement in the back squat is a reflection of readiness in the central nervous system so if we if you think about it for control if you're going to retest that specific exercise see it as a retest on your CNS so it should almost be a litmus for anyone that's involved within any sport throughout the year to kind of just see where you are okay um, and you got to get used to being up or down in relation to what the characteristics are you're trying to improve in the training program so this is something you can try which I'm not going to recommend but you want to think about it like this you know uh, test your back squat and then do a running program four times a week um, and then test your back squat again. So for people who are here, here, and you're trying to improve those characteristics of running on top of the back squat, unless you've never back squat before, your back squat's gonna go down. So you're not gonna improve by 25 pounds. And the reason behind that is just physiological. So if you have eccentric contractions over and over, it kind of makes sense that your back squat's not gonna improve you do a running program with it. If you want to do aerobic work, um, and you're going to add that to a back squat program, a true aerobic work, which has, I must just say not true, a, uh, an aerobic work that has lots of non-eccentric activity. So let's just say for ease of sake, uh, to make sense of it, let's just say you do swimming, you know, three times a week, plus a little bit of rowing, plus some airdyne, plus versa climber and FLR and jump rope, um, easy work like that. Uh, the same thing you're trying to improve the running, but you do that instead of running for a four-week program, there is a chance, no matter if you're here, here, or, or here, you may still uh, create increases in your back squat. And so you can see it was because of the lack of mechanical fatigue of those eccentric contractions in the running program. My whole point of it was that you got to create control of your testing parameters and what you're trying to do to improve that new test over time. Um, I'm not saying all you need to do, of course, squatting over a period of time, but if, you, if that's truly the measure you want to improve, you have to look at all those variables when you want to do a retest scenario to ensure that the CNS is capable of repeating it. So let's just say you do a test on Friday and you had a Thursday rest and you did the test on Friday and you did a proper warm-up only for the back squat. You did the back squat and then you did other shit afterwards. Well, four weeks down the road, I would suggest you take Thursday off and repeat the same kind of control environments for the squat. If you just show up and you're like, hey, you know, this is cool, let's just see where my squat is and you want to do, you know, double unders uh, on the minute as you improve your back squat by 10 kilos every set, um, you might be able to do it and improve if you're here or here, right? I should say up to this point in time. But if you're anywhere here on that curve, it's not going to go up. And so you can, and this is where it gets into the truth versus fantasy. Uh, people that talk about fantasy of it and use words like, well, you just got to believe or you got to suffer or you just got to trust in the mind and the emotion. That's a bunch of garbage, honestly, in terms of truth and improvements when the iron never lies, really. So don't expect that to happen if your training age is a little higher. We're just going to come in and be like, you know what? Um, screw the rules. Um, screw physiology and adaptation. I'm going to do a PR today. Um, is it a chance where you don't know the weights and uh, your CNS is really f you know, fresh and you repeat the exact same test engine you improve? Yeah, it is. But anyways, just, just remember that, that you can't escape that fact that it has to be planned appropriately if you truly want to see some testing results that uh, make you see if you have actually improved by 25 pounds. Um, I'm also going to attach a, a blog post to this in some, in some writing and maybe we'll write a little bit of mechanics um, in terms of what you can do in terms of your training that are outside of those things to improve that 25 pounds. So here's a couple things you can think about if you wanted to improve your back squat and your double leg activities by 25 pounds. I hope it helps a bit. Uh, give us feedback if you'd like anything else for us to discuss. Thanks. Have a great day.